Friends, Dave Politis, Can I Missing Project, a copyrighted edition for our video channel. And Huck TV is on the air. Yes, uh, Huck is in here. She's uh, following us consistently, making sure we do the good job. Here's a good pop. Here's a good pop. Oh, here's a good pop. Here's a good girl. Oh, yeah. That's a good girl. That's a good girl. She's going to camp out for a bit with us while I take over the helm. And uh, thank you for being here. And yes, I've had a lot of good comments about the Eagle. It really just means liberty to me. The strongest word. The most important word, liberty. And which is why I made that cap. And many of you have it. As Harvey Pratt, my buddy, did the art on the eagle. And then US flag, Ben's initials. He was a huge patriot. And then the can am missing logo on the back. Get it on our website, NA like North America, nabigfootsearch.com, our online store where you can buy everything. So, our movies are on Amazon. If you're outside the US, they're on Tubi. Go to Amazon right now and watch Missing 411, Missing 411, The Hunted, Missing 411, The UFO Connection. All of them went to number one in the world. Thank you so much for the support you've given me along the way. Uh, hundreds of you in just the last few weeks or less have told me that you've been forcibly unsubscribed by YouTube and an equal number of you have stated that you have been forcibly not notified when our videos come out. I'm a big supporter of you and I'm a big supporter of a platform that doesn't try to shadow ban me like YouTube is right now forcibly taking you down as a subscriber is not appropriate. Forcibly not telling you when a video is coming out is not appropriate. I've got something in the works and it's gonna be good. What we're gonna do is probably once a month, we're gonna have a live show where you could send in your questions, I'll answer them live. I'll do a presentation on something we've never done before. Not like this that you're gonna to see today. Something unique. We're gonna do this once a month. It'll be a pay-per-view. It's not gonna be expensive. No, I want everyone to go. It's not gonna be like 10, 15, 20 bucks to watch. No, 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 no. I'm gonna keep it down low. And we've gotta find the fine point to it. Uh, what that dollar amount is, I'm not sure right now, but we're working on trying to understand how much we should charge. I want to get five, ten thousand people watching. I mean, we're we're averaging forty to fifty thousand of views per video right now. If I could just get ten thousand of you to spend some bucks watching me for an hour, you and me opening myself up to you about your questions, see if that works. And that would help enormously with what YouTube's doing to me. So that's coming in the future. That'll be uh, probably mid-July we'll be doing that. And uh, we'll see how that goes. Tonight, today, whatever. <laughs> Got uh, a couple of interesting segments for you. Yes, interesting segments. First of all, in my book, Missing 411 Canada, there's a segment in there about two men. And they were from Champlo, Ontario. George Whedon and Merle Newcomb. This is their pictures. And uh, they were big moose hunters. And they, had, they were in a camp that was owned by the Newcomb family just outside of Champlow. 
Well, Whedon was very disabled. He broke his back and his leg was mangled in a train accident, his right leg. And he could not walk very far. Everyone knew this. But they were also best friends, so they would stay together. So in 19, this happened October 29th, 1959. They left their camp, took their guns, and they knew this area very, very, very well. They also knew that the ice wasn't real solid. It was early in the season. So they weren't gonna cross anything. Well, they didn't come back to camp. And there was a massive search. Both of them did not come back to camp. To have two hunters not come back, almost unheard of. I've had a few of those instances, but not a lot. It was a massive search. Railroad came out assisted they didn't find anything there wasn't enough snow on the ground to track through the snow but they also knew that the search wasn't going to be out there 10 15 miles because Whedon was disabled and that really threw him for a loop so the general consensus was first of all there were never any good answers some thought that they might have stepped on some ice and fallen in the lake or a river. Well, that wasn't a good idea because these guys were very experienced. They wouldn't have done that. And that's really where the theories ended. But they were all sure that when they came back in the spring of 1960 that their bodies would come up and they'd be found. So there was a massive search in late May of 1960. They went everywhere. They dragged ponds, they dragged lakes, they did everything imaginable. And then they came back later that summer. They didn't find anything. Not only was it unusual, but it was strange because these men were such experienced hunters and because Whedon was disabled. They wouldn't have split up, they would have been together. Do I know what happened? I wish I did. Now this, this happened in Champlo, Ontario, uh, quite a bit north of Sault Ste. Marie. Now, I've talked about this case before, and don't be angry about me talking about it again, because I'm leading you into something else. I'm leading you into a case that we just recently discovered. Now, the first Champlo case occur occurred October 29th, 59. This case occurred October 8th, 1977. So about 18 years later, it was a Saturday. Man's name was Frank Duvuano, Duvuano, 32 years old. He was married, his wife's name was Denise, and they had two kids and they resided in Sault Ste. Marie. He was employed by Sears as an advertising executive. It was said that everybody liked him and everybody really admired his outdoor skills because for being 32 years old, he knew his way around. He, he was one of the best hunters anywhere. He could track. He was an amazing person. So Frank had seven brothers. All of them loved to hunt. All of them were really close. Well, Frank had a friend that owned a lodge on Nemecosonda, lake about 20 miles northeast of Champlo. Now here's the area we're talking about. Now first of all, the first two hunters that we talked about, they disappeared on the outskirts of Champlo. Now one thing I want you to pay attention to, see all the water? I always have stated that all these things are water related. Well, about 20 miles northeast this is the lake, okay? It's the lake he was going to. That was Hawk. So, this friend of his owned this lodge. Yeah, that was you that kicked that. <laughs> she just looks like, uh-oh. 
So his friend said, hey, you guys can use my lodge on the lake as a location that you could stage and go moose hunting from. But I would suggest that you park on Highway 101 and you go in and blaze a trail to the lodge because it's pretty overgrown at this point and since we can't get to it by boat, blaze the trail in so when your brothers go in the following weekend you can get there. Frank says, okay. So on October 7th, it's a Friday, Frank drove from his home to a place called Wawa where he'd spend one night, then drive on Highway 101 northeast of Champlow, park his car, and blaze a trail out to the lodge. Now his brothers were all stoked because number one, they loved hunting with their brother. Number two, the moose hunting out here is fantastic. And number three, they were staying in a warm lodge every night. So that was great. Now, Frank thought when he was going to go out there that someone was going to be there in the lodge. So on October 8th, Saturday, Frank drove his car on Highway 101, stopped at the appropriate point closest to the lake, removed his 16-gauge shotgun, and started to hike. Now, unbeknownst to Frank, two OPP highwaymen watched him get out of his car and go into the bush with the rifle or a shotgun. They didn't think much of it at the time. Well, on Saturday night, about 10 p.m., Denise, his wife, was waiting for Frank. He said he'd be home by then. He never showed up. So Denise started to call Frank's dad, Rocco. That's a great name, Rocco. And his brothers. And eventually called the police, Sault Ste. Marie, and said, my husband's missing. Well, they knew the location where Frank's car should be located. So the Sault Ste. Marie per police contact Champlain Police and the highway department. And they send some police officers up to check the highway to see if the car is there. Very late that night, they get a report back, the car is there. Well, that's good and bad. Good, they now have a search point to start from. Bad, something negative happened to Frank. Otherwise, he'd be out. He was extremely reliable. He wouldn't break a trust. He and his wife had a great relationship. It was unusual that Frank did not make it out because he was such a good outdoorsman. So they found the car on October 9th. The OPP starts setting up a search for Frank. They were able to get a helicopter to fly over the area from his car to the lodge. They knew that that would be the location he would be in because he wasn't going to go hunting. He was on a tight schedule and he had to be back Saturday night. So he wasn't going to mess around. Well, they do the flyover, three miles out, three miles back, and they do a couple of side trips. They don't see anything, nothing unusual. The lodge looks like it was never entered, looks locked up. On the following day, the OPP get a canine officer in Frank's car, and they start to search. Now, this is a great idea. Before the masses start coming in, to use the canine. One problem I have with this is that they're a, dare, they're a day behind now. Why didn't they do this on the day before when they did the helicopter flyover? But they didn't. They waited a day. So now if you're Frank and you're injured, one day means a whole lot because it was cold out there. The following day, October 11th, 25 searchers covered the ground from the car to the lodge. Searchers said that they didn't believe Frank ever got to the lodge. They said they searched the area around it. They didn't find a broken twig, tracks, nothing. So now they're in a real confusing spot. They just hiked from the car to the lodge and they didn't see anything. 
October 12th, they had 50 searchers daily covering a wider path to and from those locations, and they kept going out in a wider and wider area. They did this for five more days. They weren't finding anything. And they confirmed that he never got in the lodge. On the 18th, the two highway patrol who reported f seeing Frank enter the bush heard about where the OPP was searching to and from. And they said that they thought that they saw Frank enter into the bush at a region further down from his car than what they were initially looking. So they changed their, their search criteria a bit, started to go in the area he went in. Chaplos Search and Rescue was leading the search with the OPP plane, a helicopter, and two dogs. October 22nd. Search now had been going on for about 12 days. The, Frank worked for the Sears Advertising Group in Sault Ste. Marie. The advertising department, with the approval of Sears, closed down for two days. And they sent the assistant general manager and 15 employees from his group to search. Frank, Frank was really well liked and respected for his skills. Nobody in that department could believe he was lost. No one believed it. Well, they searched for two days, went back to Sault Ste. Marie, had nothing. On October 28th, five more days, none of Frank's seven brothers believed he died. None of them. It came down to Frank's abilities. Frank's wife, on her own, Denise, contacted a 27-year-old psychic, a man named Jim Conrad, out of Oakville, Ontario, who told her that Frank was alive. Now, this man, Conrad, didn't charge the family anything for his services. He was... One thing I say, as if a psychic is ever going to charge for their services, you run as fast as you can the other way. This man didn't. He was a good soul. The psychic said that Frank tried to cross a river near the cabin. He hit his head real hard, became injured, and took shelter in a nearby cabin. Family talked to the police. And the OPP was not very happy. They kind of put down Mr. Conrad in a very straightforward way. They said that both sides of the river, for miles in either direction, had been searched. They found no tracks. They found no clothing. They found zero evidence that Frank was on either bank. They searched every cabin within two miles of the river. Nobody was in them. Well, that was, that's pretty, pretty clear that they were doing a good job. On October 31st, almost 20 days after Frank disappeared, his family had made a repeated attempts to get the military deployed. They knew that the military would search for missing people because they had heard about it in the past. Now, 20 days into the search and rescue, the military approves a limited deployment. The family was upset because they only sent 30 searchers out. They were expecting 100. They searched for three days, found nothing. They gave up. It was at about this time that the psychic changed his train of thought and said, well, I might have been a little off. Instead of being in this area, he might be in this area. And there, there lies the issue with, with a psychic. I, I have no idea how they get this information. Everyone says it's different. Every psychic says it's different. Now, maybe 
he really did have this revelation and really it did change. I don't know. But from a search and rescue perspective, that's hard to swallow. Now, November 10th, this is where it gets interesting to me. Chapel of police are approached by a French-speaking man named Jean, in English it would be Jean, Jean Perrault, who lived in a remote lumber mill about six miles northeast of the Lake Lodge. So, the lodge is here. Lumber mill was up in this area. Distance from here to here is about three miles. So double that, it's out here by this lake somewhere. Gotcha. So Jean says that on October 9th, that would be two days after Frank started his trip up to the lake. says that uh, a huge rainstorm hit his lumber camp. And in the middle of the night, he says he was woke up by somebody calling for help. He said it was loud. He said it, it sounded close. So in the pouring rain, he got up in the middle of the night, turned on his lantern, went outside in the pouring rain and called back. He said that the line, the, uh, the rain put out his lantern and he never got a response from calling back. Now at the same time, his sister-in-law who also lived in the camp also heard the cries for help. And the next day her and her brother, brother-in-law, decided that she should call the chapel of police. And she says they did on October 10th. Now, after Champlo hears this statement coming from these two lumber people, a representative made a public statement from the police stating they never received the call and were adamant that the call was never made. Equally adamant, was Jean Perrault and his sister-in-law saying, no, the call was made and nothing was done about it and you ignored it. At about this time, Frank's family had heard about what was happening at this lumber mill. And the lumber mill, well, again, it was like six miles from the lodge, so not an insurmountable distance. Coupled with the fact that Jean said in his lifetime nobody had ever been around there calling for help, the timing of it and the geographical association with it being so close, it had, it had to have something to do with Frank. And that's what the family believed. So they got OPP to send a special search and rescue helicopter from Toronto to search the area for their brother. And at the same time, Rocco went out to the lumber yard with Jean just to look at the area. And there was two inches of snow in the area at the time. So it was just starting to get cold. And freezing temps were hitting the area. Everything was starting to get froze over. Now here, I, I've told people this before and I'll say it again. Equipment failures with these search and rescues are common. What happened? The helicopter comes from Toronto, and just as they're arriving and they're flying over the lumber yard en route to Chamblo, they start losing oil pressure. They have to set down on an emergency status in Champlo, and they have to have a mechanic from Toronto come out and fix the helicopter. They never got it up in a reasonable amount of time to search for Frank. There you go. Now in December, they were freezing temps all over. Everyone agreed that Frank had to have been deceased. And they decided that in May, June, when the ice starts to melt, the OPP agreed to do overflights over the river and the lake 
to see if Frank's body would float to the surface. At about this time, and this time being like mid-November, the psychic came back and just said, I must have been wrong. Frank must have made it out of the area. Now that's a big difference from saying he's holed up in a cabin to he made it out of the area. I'm sorry. I find that is a big difference. Now let's go back. When the people, two people, heard somebody calling for help in the middle of the night on October 9th. Weather. It's pouring rain. Whoever was calling for help obviously did not know where they were. Otherwise, they would have walked into the lumber camp. But they were calling for help in the middle of the night, which I find very odd. If it was me and I was trying to conserve my energy, I would know that nobody's out in the middle of the night looking for you. So why would you be calling out for help? Just saying. Now I go back to people being caught in a portal, in a multi-dimension, in a parallel universe. Maybe they don't know the date and the time, and they're just calling out. And when the people go out and call for help, and the others can't find them, there's something unusual about that to me. Now in this instance, two of them not living together, so they heard it from different locations in the lumber camp. What really, really gets me mad is that the OPP didn't go out and search the area. They said, well, there was no proof that that was Frank, and uh, hold your taters. Why would it matter if it was Frank or not? Somebody was calling for help. So why didn't you go look? Why didn't you take the dogs and go out and search? Yeah, it gets me mad. Frank isn't the issue. Anybody calling for help, you should go out and search for him. Now, Jean Perrault said that he did call back when the person called for help. And the following day, when the rain stopped, they did go and walk through that area and didn't see anything. They called out, didn't hear anything. So the minimal effort, but who's to say that somebody's not out there deceased now? Remember, November in Ontario, up in the far north, a rainy night, easy, easy to get hypothermia. Now, the word was is that when Frank took off from his car, he was wearing uh, a light shirt and pants and carrying a shotgun, but he didn't have a heavy coat. So the chances of him living a long time in the bush in November, very minimal. And November 12th would have been almost a month after he disappeared. Frustrating. The relationships here, lots of water in this, in this area of Ontario, a lot. This isn't just the third case from that area. We've had others as well. We've had planes disappear in this area. Now remember, the disappearance of Whedon and Newcomb was in this general area as well. They were never found. Now these two had notoriety even back in the early 60s because it was such an unusual disappearance. When I start saying two people going away, missing, neither one is found, that's odd. Now, on the case regarding Frank, you would think that somebody would have found his shotgun over the years. Nothing was ever found. Whedon and Newcomb, you would think that somebody would have found their rifles or shotguns. Nothing was found. And it's a guarantee that as waters heat up and the, and the bodies starts to decompose, and starts to bloat, it'll come to the surface. And here's three cases where the bodies were never found. 
highly unusual. Now, the Newcomb and Whedon case are in my book, Missing 411 Canada. That's a huge book, and Canada has a lot of cases. But you can get it at our store, NA, BigfootSearch.com, like North America, NA. Huck is laying here almost asleep, but being a really good girl. So, remember, this is the kindness, the kindness revolution. Please, be kind. It costs you nothing. You sleep now? Huh? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's a good girl. Oh, yeah, it's a good girl. Oh, you like that? You're a good girl. Okay, pull out.